Good afternoon, everybody. I think we should be in time for the next session at quarter past four on achieving a balanced knee through bone, implant and soft tissue modifications. And I would like to invite the conveners on stage, Arun Mullaji and Pranav Agarwal. Please do come on stage and we should be able to start on time. And I would request them to also invite the chairpersons. Can I invite our panelists, uh, Dr. Gautam Chakra, Mr. Gautam Chakravarti from the UK, Dhanashekar Raja, and Anub Jurani. And the person who's going to chair this session, Parak Sanjedi. So please join us. Um, we have unfortunately one uh, panelist missing. He's Dr. Guru already. He couldn't make it. And uh, we have our three panelists here and Pranav and I will be uh, taking you through this session on achieving a balanced knee, bone, soft tissue and implant modifications. Pranav, you'd like to come here? Yes. Yeah, you can also join. All right. So all these cases need surgery. Be brief to the panelists. For each condition, we are going to take the views of the panelists for about seven minutes, talking to them about the alignment, cuts, releases, and implant. And then we'll have a take-home message uh, by each of them. So let's first get a sense of what our chairperson and the panelists think about uh, whether they use measured resection or gap balancing, starting with Anup. So measured resection for deformities less than 10 degrees mostly. So you resect whatever you've lost and replace. But in more deformities more than 10 degrees, 15, 20 degrees, gap balancing. Gap balancing, is okay. Any difference, Raja? I mostly combine uh, uh, measured resection with gap balancing. Extension gap balance first, flexion gap mostly gap balancing. I change my femoral component rotation according to the flexion gap once my extension gap is balanced. And Gotham? A hybrid, bit of both. Definitely measure the uh, what I've resected and replace. So I won't resect less than what the component thickness is, and then adjust the soft tissues to fit fit around it. I do use a standard rotation of three degrees because the jigs that oh, we'll I come have, to that. Just now we're talking about just just the basic concept, so that we know where everyone stands. Parag, so more towards uh, gap balancing. Okay, Pranav. I use a combination of both. Sir. Okay, so it's a bit of both. All right. Next, alignment. So we'll start with you, Pranab. What do you do for alignment? We have these various options of alignment now. It's important to get this right and then go into the deformity correction so we can really talk about soft tissue balancing in detail so that we don't need to refer to this again. So Pranav, what sort of alignment do you use? Mechanical, that's 90-90 for your implants and 180 for the hip knee ankle axis. Yes, that is what I use. You use mechanical. Yes, yes. Parag? Oh, I am 100% mechanical. Mechanical. Gautam? Mechanical. Mechanical. Mechanical and I am doing conventional with the advent of robotics. I do some adjusted mechanical as well. So look at the preoperative phenotype. If it's a mechanical tall male patient with femoral valgus angle 5 degrees, you go for mechanical. If it's constitutional virus with high neck shaft angle with a board tibia, board femur, go for kinematic with the help of navigation or robotics. Okay. And valgoid, uh, be, be according to the pre-op phenotype. So you will vary it. Um, I use mostly mechanical with a couple of degrees of varus on the tibia, not more, and then adjust the femur to within three degrees, aiming for roughly within three degrees of HK of 180. Okay, what about femoral rotation? Let's start with you, Anup. How do you rotate the femur? Or do you use any of these landmarks or you just um, use a combination of them? So trans epicondylar axis is my main landmark, but the important thing is to see the wear on the posterior medial condyle. So if it's worn out completely, I would decrease the rotation. Be still parallel, but so if you're using the TEA, that doesn't matter where the wear is. That's really. right. Yeah. What about you, Dr. Raja? I use the trans epicondylar axis and try to match the flexion gap to the uh, uh, the jigs and then balancing gap. So trans epicondylar, Gotham? Trans epicondylar, but my 
more so in a valgus knee. I'm 100% trans epicondylar in a valgus knee. Varus knee, I use Anoop's um, idea of uh, the assessing the extent of wear on the posterior medial and perhaps pay less attention to the axis because it fits in correctly. What about you, Parag? So, parallel to the tibial cut technique, I rotate the femur to make the tibial cut uh, parallel to my posterior cut, and that's how I adjust the rotation. Okay. Uh, I tend to actually take off almost equal amounts from both condyles now. So, although I use mechanical alignment for the main coronal axis for rotation, I'm now using more and more of equal resections, and I find that they have a very good flexion gap and excellent flexion as well as the ability to sit cross-legged and the patella tracking is really not an issue. Okay, now I want to know from you guys how much laxity, when we start talking about balancing a knee, we need to come down to specifics. What do you mean by a balanced knee? So, I know we can talk about the whole range of motion but let's talk about extension and 90 degree flexion. How much laxity do you accept medially, laterally, flexion versus extension? So do you have your extension gaps equally tight as your flexion gaps, everyone? Anyone not doing this? No, always Mike. equal. Always equal. Almost always equal Almost gaps. Always. I defer. Flexion extension. You? Flexion, little bit laxity on the lat uh, lateral aspect. On the lateral side. So would you define how much laxity? So 1.5 1, 1 to 2 mm. In flexion on the lateral yes, side. Yes. Anoop, any difference? So, 3 millimeters lateral flexion gap, 2 millimeters lateral extension gap. And this would be for a varus knee, I presume? For a varus but knee. But for a valgus knee, would you change that? Yeah, definitely. What would you do? Uh, the other the reverse, around. the reverse. The other way around. Okay, Gautam? Uh, no, because I'm, I essentially go for an equal gap. I'm a, a retainer, so it's very difficult to create an excessive gap unless you put a thinner polyethylene, so I go for an equal gap both in flexion and extension. And medial and lateral. And medial and in lateral. In flexion and extension. Same. Same. Full gaps. Okay, what about you? Yes, I agree with that. Same. And how do you decide your tensions? Is there some method that you use for figuring out your tension? Just by Prague? the feel of it. Just feel. Feel in extension and 90 degrees flexion then fully it opens equally. How do you stress it? So do you use a tensioner? Do you use a... a Neural force. Just by the hands, the manual. With the hands. Thing. Gotham? Spacer blocks, flexion, assess it, extension, put a, because of the type of implant I use, I correct the, uh, um, put an extra shim in it to accommodate the thickness of the implant and then a manual feel as Parag's mentioned. You start with the spacer block, extension and flexion, then with the trial components. With the robot, we have the sensor tensor. Okay. Anup? Yeah, same tensionometer because we use navigation slash robotics, so we get objective values on the screen. Okay. Uh, now let's move on to Varus, okay? So that's a typical case that we all see, so I want you to tell us uh, step by step how you'll deal with this. So that's the full length x-ray, there's a post HD on the left side, nothing done on the right side. These are the close-ups, AP and lateral views. So the questions are going to be really, are you going to do this lady bilateral or staged? Anyone for bilateral, simultaneous? If my anesthetist and the physicians allow me, I'll go for bilateral. Assuming patient fit. Bilateral. Bilateral. Anyone doing unilateral for this? And in my setup, we do unilateral followed by the uh, second stage at two months staged. to three months. Yeah, staged. Okay. They're staggered by three to five days. Three to five days. Doesn't that have the highest rate of complications? Uh, it's been routine last 20 years. I don't think there's increased complication. Okay. Uh, Bilateral no. if medically fit. I would do it staged. Staged. Okay. Next question is uh, what type of implant would you use for this patient? Again, go back to the x-rays. Anything specific? Different? I'd start. Anup, start with you. So, PS. Your standard implant, PS. St standard PS. Okay. PS, probably keep a tibial stem extension if necessary, there is a bone defect. Okay, perfect. Stem, Gotham. I'll aim for a CR first with PS as standby. Uh, on the right side, I don't think so you'll require a stem. As soon as you cut, the, cut it to the tip of that uh, medial defect, you'll get a 10 millimeter resection on the lateral side. So when you see this sort of a case, would you always keep CR and PS? Do you have your inventory? Yes, we, we have that on the, on the shelf. I also have the 
stems and wedges and everything else on the shelf. So I don't have to prepare from that aspect. Right, Be because all of us don't have that luxury of having such a large inventory and keeping stems and CR and PS. So, so we have Parag an equal number of PS and CRs, okay. but only one set of stems and wedges. Parag? Assuming I was using a CR, I don't use, but if it was that I was doing CR knees, definitely this would not be a CR, I would do a PS. Okay. Which is usually what I do. Now let's come down to this. When would you use a constraint or a hinge? When, you, when would you keep it? For a various knee, do you uh, use it often or very rarely? Oh, all of you. So for Start me, with you, Gotham. Do you I'm not very often at all. For, not, not for a various knee. Okay. Uh, in a virus knee with recurvatum, I might keep a hinge as a backup. For uh, a severe virus with severe lateral opening, I will keep a constraint as a backup. All right. Now tell me what exactly are you going to release in this patient? Let's talk about her right knee, okay? The right knee is a more severe one. So now we'll go through the, the actual release. Anup, what would you be releasing in so, order to correct this? Right, so first of all, uh, deep medial collateral, downsizing of tibia, removal of all osteophytes, especially the hidden osteophyte under the MCL on the femoral side. Yes. So once I've done all of that, and uh, I'll be, I should be able to correct this deformity. If not, if not, if the deformity is less than 10, more than 10 is still, then I may choose to do a medial epicondyle or osteotomy, if necessary. Dr. Raja, anything different? Uh, in these severe deformities, I will go for uh, measure resection. Very difficult to get your uh, gap balancing technique in this. So we will go with the measure resection. Street, keep releasing the structures, same like what Anub uh, said. Same structures that Anub did, but uh, it will be a measure resection technique. So um, I do the femur first. I'll complete the femur based on a five degree. That's my standard. Then do a measured resection, both femur and tibia. And depending on the residual deformity after I've decompressed, what I call as decompression of the MCL by taking away all the osteophytes, both from the femoral side and the tibial side, and then start doing sequential releases. Uh, and uh, lastly, so releasing the what? Releasing what? Sorry, That's the, the key question. Uh, anteromedial capsule, the superficial MCL, but not all the way down, going round to the equator. And if there's a persistent virus after that, it releases the deep medial collateral ligament and the posterior medial capsule but after I've taken all the osteophytes off. So if you would have asked me this question five years ago, I would have done a very extensive release. No, I'm now, asking you today, Parag. Right now the point. release is less. You know, I'll just do the deep uh, MCL along with the capsule, go posterior medial in a figure of four position. And these are the cases, you know, the severe ones especially. I would leave them a little bit tight and, you know, I would cut a little more on the medial side and leave it a little whereas. I wouldn't try to really correct it fully and I would accept Now you're talking more about a little kinematic really alignment yeah. concept. Yeah. Okay. You would like to keep the tibia in a little bit of varus and still maintain an alignment. Yes, yes which I wouldn't have done five years ago access. but over a period of time my releases have gone down. Okay, so this is what we did. Uh, we used a stem on the right side. Uh, standard releases only the superficial, uh, we don't touch the superficial MCL at all, just a deep MCL and uh, remove the osteophytes and a posterior medial capsular release and uh, that should suffice to give you uh, alignment and balance. Uh, very rarely, if there's severe deformity, as mentioned by Anup, you might need to do a medial uh, sliding osteotomy, like in this particular patient with severe bowing. Um, and that's so may I ask you and the panelists, what would be the one indication that you would see on an X-ray or during surgery, which will give you an indication that you might require a sliding osteotomy? So when there's typically large extra-articular deformity bowing on the femur, tibia, I think that's when you would need it, in short. Yep. Yeah. So it's a bowing on the femur with lateral opening. That's where I'll do and a femoral opening. sliding. If there is tibial bowing, I'll go for a tibial osteotomy. And very rarely, if it's so badly stretched out, then I think there's no real option but to use a more constraint. Would you all agree? Yep. Right. That yes. would be the way out for this. Um, and even keep a hinge ready. So here we used a, a more constrained TC3 with uh, bone loss uh, taken care of by a sl sleeve and stem uh, configuration. All right, so various take-home message. Who's going to present that? Dr. Chakravarti. So my remit is on the various take-home message.
I've got one minute, so I'm going to move rather quickly. So understand the degree of deformity. Use thin points classification. If you haven't read it, good paper to read. Understand what the tight structures are. Tips and tricks. This should start when you first see the patient. Preoperative assessment and an examination under anesthesia. Your approach, remove the osteophytes, provisional release, accurate bone cuts because I'm a measured resection guy, trial prosthesis, further release as required, implant the definitive prosthesis and insert, and if necessary, a further final adjustment. And the rest of it will be covered later. And that's the summary. Wow, that didn't take one minute even. That was super fast. <laughs> I, I got that, I got that. All right, let's go back to uh, now the next, next deformity. We'll talk about valgus knees now, which are typically more uh, complex to handle. So let's start with this lady. Uh, Pranav, how are you going to deal with this lady? Uh, what approach will you use if the patella is subluxated? For example, on the left side, mm -hmm. what would you do? So even so, most of my deformity corrections, most of my TKRs happen from a medial parapatellar approach. Okay. I usually use that. Rarely have I used a lateral approach. Any difference? Yep. So if I have a fixed valgus more than 10 degrees, I go through a lateral approach, otherwise uh, through a medial approach. And how does that help you? It, uh, it gives a direct approach to the lateral structures. The patellar tracking is good. It, it forms an intraoperative release of the lateral retinoculum. So that way it is good. Yep. So just as a matter of uh, uh, point for the audience, the one thing that I do in a valgus knee is make sure, try and assess what happens to the knee in 90 degrees of flexion. Because if the valgus actually corrects completely in 90 degrees of flexion, the chances are you will require very little soft tissue release. We'll and come predominantly. To the release. We're just talking about the approach now. I'm going okay, to give sorry. you a chance to just, talk no, about No, no, the, the one before, just to make sure that there's an examination okay. before we set up. And All right, up. so before you go to the release, it's important to see whether it corrects in uh, flexion or not. If it corrects in flexion, then more, more likely you, you wouldn't require a release. That's a great point. But here we are talking about the approach. Would everyone use a medial yeah. parapatella any other than Dr. Raja, a lateral approach? In this case, I would use a lateral parapatella because of the patella. Otherwise, my threshold to use a lateral is very, very high. I wouldn't, but because the patella is, you know, subluxated or dislocated. I, I'm a, Anticipating a lateral release, so might as well use a lateral approach. Perfect. All right. The only thing is the closure is a little more difficult with the lateral approach, especially distally. You've got to be very careful that you don't leave the gap and the capsulotomy is fully closed. So you've got to take care there. All right. So now we come to the releases. So for this lady, what release do you anticipate, let's say, on the left side? So here are your structures. So what are you going to release, Anup? So, as I can see, this is valgus with some degree of hyperextension. It's not valgus with fixed flexion deformity. So, IT band would be the first to go. I'll see what my analysis is on navigation screen. If it is still uh, more than 7, 8 degrees, then I would go more, remove all the osteophytes, decompress the lateral side, and popliteal spine. Do you think crust. removal of osteophytes helps in a valgus knee? Because yes, in it's... Uh, inserted on the fibular head. Yeah, but decompressing the IT band. Decompressing the IT band. IT band, yes. Yeah, it's because the flare really goes lateral and it hits the IT band. So decompressing the IT band. Once that corrects, then I would look at the lateral flexion gap. If it's tight, then I would pie crust or partially uh, tenotomize the uh, popliteus. The popliteal tendon. Popliteal tendon, yeah. Okay, Dr. Raja. So there are structures which are tight in extension and structures which are tight both in extension and flexion. The IT band and the capsule are tight in extension. So deformity mostly on extension will be corrected with the release of IT band and postlateral capsulotomy. If these structures are tight even in flexion, that will be due to lateral collateral ligament and popliteus. So that I will do a sliding osteotomy. Gotham, any so thoughts? So going back oh, to what yes, I said correct. Yeah, uh, before, Assess whether it's tight, in, uh, what the deform correction of the deformity, inflection or extension. If the deformity is only in extension, then IT band first, posterior lateral capsule, and occasionally you release the popliteus tendon to allow some rotation to take place. If it's the combination of both, that inflection and extension, you've got a persistent valgus or marginal correction of valgus, then apart from these, you may have to address the lateral collateral ligament, but it's much more rarer to do that. Majority of the times, if you actually examine the knee 
with the knee in 90 degrees of flexion, you'll find that there is significant correction of the valgus deformity. And that is something that Trey, um, as, as colleagues, we probably don't do enough. We just ask somebody else to set the patient up. And it's better to actually examine a valgus knee in the anesthetic room and make sure, and, and you get a much better idea. You should do that for all your knees. You should examine them under anesthesia, yes, irrespective of the... We probably, we probably don't pay as much attention to a varus knee because we think that is easy, but that's wrong. Nothing is easy. Each, each one of these knees can become very difficult yeah. if you've not paid attention. Parag, specific releases? Yeah, so the, in extension, I would do whatever everybody has said, the lateral collateral, the pop fib ligament. In flexion, what I do is by the inside-out technique, I put a laminar spreader at 90 degrees, stretch it and do pie crusting with the 11 blade. You know, some minimal inside out releases. Pie crossing of what? Which structure? ITB and the lateral collateral, whatever is tight. I just Lateral collateral? Whatever I can feel. You know, lateral I just use collateral. a 16 gauge needle or 11 blade. And when I put my, you know, laminar spreader, I feel some tight structures. Maybe the capsule, maybe the ITB and I just release that with six or seven stabs. Does anyone release the lateral collateral ligament in a valgus knee? We have a show of hands. How many people would release? And in their experience, how many people have had the occasion of going all the way till, till an LCL release? There are a couple of people there. Wow. I thought most people don't release the LCL. Whatever is tight in flexion, really, you know, because uh, you, you palpate contract. that, Arun. Okay. You have a dysplastic type of valgus, like a childhood deformity. I think most valgus knees will release. come in alignment if an ITB plus a posterior capsule and the rarest chance a popliteal release is done. Mostly they will settle down. Correct. So, so these are experience. the structures. IT band typically if it's uh, tight, posterior lateral capsule and if required the popliteal fibular ligament. If your flexion gap is tight, you don't really need to release a popliteus because it's a stretchable structure. What contracts is the popliteal fibular ligament. The moment you do that, you should be able to get complete release. This lady just required uh, minimal releases as described. And this is her 16 year follow up. And you can see her um, x rays are unchanged over the years. Now, if it remains tight, some of you have described what needs to be done. So, there's one other possibility that um, you can do what's called a sliding osteotomy. And here, this was extremely rigid. Um, we've done that on both the sides. And very rarely when the MCL is totally stretched out like this, would you require some more level constraint. of constraint, constraint right? Yeah. You agree with all of that? That's right. Okay. Yeah. And the, these are her post-op uh, images. So the take-home message for valgus is that, as mentioned, you may have a flexion contracture or you may have hyperextension. But uh, it could be rigid very rarely. Most of the time it's correctable. If the L MCL is stretched, then you have to take that into account. Most of the time, you don't need to release the LCL, just an ITB release, posterior lateral corner, popliteal fibular ligament. And rarely you need to do a lateral epicondyle or osteotomy. If it's extremely tight, I prefer to do that rather than releasing the lateral collateral ligament because in that case, your flexion gap becomes unstable laterally. And rarely would you require constraint or a hinge. Now we move on to flexion deformity and Pranav is going to summarize at the end, right? Yes, I'll do that. So now I think you will differentiate between rheumatoid and osteo. So let's take rheumatoids which are a little more difficult like this lady. These are her x-rays, um, often a little bit of valgus in addition to the flexion deformity. And what you would have is typically an extension gap which is very tight compared to your flexion gap, right? You all agree with that? So now how are we going to do this? Would you do this bilateral? Again, I think we've been through this before, right? If the patient is fit, bilateral. probably bilateral, otherwise staged. These patients actually should be done bilateral. Bilateral if possible. Fixed flexion deformity cases, because otherwise it's very difficult for them to walk. Absolutely right. So if they are fit, we should try and do them together. Now, would you give any pre-op physiotherapy to these patients? No. Anyone? No, it doesn't work. Casting, splinting, wedging the plaster, run up. Is the pre-op physiotherapy in view of getting a uh, betterment of the deformity, then that doesn't really work. Okay. So we are all agreed, no real pre-op physio. Now what about uh, your constraint, level of constraint, CR, PS, any thoughts, Anup? So PS. Most of the time. This 30 degrees can be managed with PS, yeah. Right. And how many degrees would you go for a hinge or a constraint? 
hinge i don't think uh, except for recurvatum deformities ffds don't need a hinge ever in an ankylosed knee yeah inflection? Ankyl ankylosed inflection if especially if the flexion gap is unmanageable it's too big then the extension gap then maybe then but maybe those are a hinge very rare cases so very rarely yeah so ps something more than 30 degrees i'll consider a, a constraint because there is a chance of mid flexion instability so i'll take one level up if i'm correcting severe deformity more than 30 degrees so now tell me gautam how are you going to deal with this situation where your extension gap is so tight and your flexion gap is lax or it's it's bigger so how are you going to equalize them so that's it, what we are talking about so it depends on how tight it is well, let's I, say there's a 5 mm difference uh, do adequate releases to the um, posterior releases re so what would you release okay, posteriorly sorry. so posterior capsule elevate that with the help of an um, or curved osteotome you put the uh, put a laminar spreader so that you can actually visualize it so that you're not doing it blind i think it's very important not to do it blind it's also important that when you put a laminar spreader to be mindful of the fact that in a particularly in a rheumatoid patient the bone is very soft so if you jack it up very quickly and very rather ferociously you're going to cause more bone damage and you need to be mindful of that as well release that i am a very cr person so i still aim for a cr and my ps going to a ps is as a last resort yes i have that advantage that i have it on the system so so let's say now you release the capsule where are you going to release the capsule of the uh, uh, of the back of the femur of the back of the femur using the, what device or instrument? i use a curved uh, osteotome or you can use a bristos uh, or a gouge or a, or a gouge something like that i have the i have a curved osteotome which fits in very well along the curve of it right parag yeah similar so to if there's a mismatch what i would not hesitate i'll increase the distal femoral cut i wouldn't okay so you will cut the femur you won't bother more. too much about and the then i will oversize the femoral anything? component to match the cap anu so it's a mix of everything 1 or 2 mm more resection of the femur upsize the femur to snug in the flexion gap take off 1 or 2 mm more by upsize you mean you want to posteriorize it posteriorize the flexion gap right yeah, because you can upsize it anteriorly also you're talking yeah, about upsize no, and bring it down posteriorly downsize and increase the flexion of the femoral component to snug in the flexion space so you flex the femoral component and bring it posteriorly that close right. the flexion gap that's right take off one or two mm of tbr then assess and then release with a curved cautery and curved osteotome all around the femur so that will correct the deformity dr raja anything different so we'll start with the tbl cut distal femoral cut standard Do, release the PCL and go for the sizing. If you get an in-between size, I'll go for a higher size. We'll do the posterior condylar resection. I won't finalize the chamfer cuts. Do the capsule release. Put your space uh, space a block in. If I'm able to correct the deformity, make sure you don't release the capsule in the midline, right? So I have two questions. Yeah. One is how many of the panelists would dial in a two millimeter extra cut on the femoral side, the dis the distal femur, right from the beginning? You would do it, sir. I, I know. I do I, I do it as a. I do it as a routine. Doing it. No, you should. I uh, forgive me. You should try and refrain from doing it because you can get mid flexion instability. True. So you must first release the capsule. If you are unable to do so, you should not do it as the first step. That's my thought process. So in my experience, I I actually put a move the block. The system that I use, although it's meant to cut nine millimeter, it never cuts nine millimeter. Okay. It always cuts seven. so you always get an extension tightness so i've already always migrate to adding 2 more millimeters right from the beginning so that i get my measured resection of 9 millimeters so rather than confusing the nursing staff i do it myself okay so i've taken 2 millimeters off but i've not actually taken any excess bone off it's just that the system does not cut what it says it will do right and when you use a cr knee in a fixed flexion deformity associated with another deformity how many times have you had to revisit and probably do a release of the pcl or increase the posterior slope of the tibia good question so if if that's particularly when i get the posterior slope not quite right now again it's a little bit system bias where the system is so clumsy at the bottom end that it gives you it, it there's an inherently built in slope after 0 degrees and it, but it doesn't give you a 0 degree slope um, and in some cases it works differently in an asian knee particularly it's bad because asian knees inherently have got an increased amount of slope as opposed to a caucasian knee in a caucasian knee the natural slope is less than an asian knee and that makes a lot of difference so here you 
here I've seen that colleagues put a slightly increased slope than I would do in a Caucasian near the rupee. But I think in a flexion contracture, you've got to be a little careful with taking too much of the posterior part of the tibia. I think you should reduce the slope, not increase it. That's right. Irrespective yeah. of, uh, you know, whether it's Asian or Caucasian, I think. That's because right. Because you're just increasing your, your flexion, flexion gap. So yeah. we All right. So in the interest of time, this, these are the three options you have. Posterior capsulotomy, release the gastroc sometimes if it's really tight and resect more of the distal femur. So this, these are the patient's post-op x-rays. Now, would you treat, how do you treat them post-op? Any splintage, slab, and what complications will you look for before you leave the OR? Anup. I'll carefully look at the pulse. That's the first thing. And once the patient is out of anesthesia, I would look at the peroneal nerve, especially with FFD with valgus cases. And uh, I would not, I would try and correct them fully at least to three, four, five degrees, never more than five degrees, I will uh, let you know go. Excellent point. Any, anything else in terms of post-op care? So I'll definitely give a back slab, you know, I have something like a push knee splint. Push knee splint. To correct the residual flexion deformity. Often these patients have quad weakness along with uh, their flexion contracture and they would need probably electrical stimulation and ex physiotherapy for a prolonged period to prevent recurrence. These are the patient's uh, images at two years. Now, what if you had something even more severe like this, 75 degrees? Is there anything additional that you would do to correct this? Yes, percutaneous tenotomy of the hams. Anyone else? Could you also tell us when would you do this? Intra procedure, during the uh, time yeah, of the surgery? Yeah, during the procedure. You'll turn the patient around and then do it? No, no, you can do it from the side. Palpate you can do it from, it from the, the side. side. And that's yeah. exactly what we've done here. Uh, posterior uh, tenotomies, yeah. percutaneous, like you do for a CP child, uh, you can do a tenotomy. Yeah. All right. Now, any difference with osteoarthritic patients um, with FD? Yeah, definitely. Uh, osteoarthritic patient, I would never leave him in flexion on table. I will make all efforts to make sure that the flexion deformity in osteoarthritic knee is corrected. But if it is rheumatoid, you know, it will stretch out. Yeah, so 10 that's degrees, why I, I, wouldn't, think, uh, I would accept uh, that. I think the capsular release, etc., is really required more for rheumatoid patients and less so for uh, OA patients, where if you remove the osteophytes, you should be in, in a good shape to get full correction. So over to Pranav, a quick summary of flex flexion deformities. Can we have a change in presentation, please? So in interest of time, I'll just go through this one algorithm on the left-hand side of the screen. We've already discussed that it's important to do soft tissue releases before we go in for a distal femoral cut. In this particular case where we have a, uh, when we are dealing with, uh, sorry, with uh, cruciate retaining knees, if the extension gap at some point is not equal to the flexion gap, then we can address it using uh, increase in posterior tibial slope and uh, releasing the PCL a bit. If that doesn't work, then we must convert to a PS knee. This is the algorithm that I would follow because I usually do PS knees. Osteophyte removal in an OA knee is definitely necessary because that causes the tenting. Then correct the coronal deformity. Release gastrocnemus from the posterior aspect of the femur. Divide the capsule at the level of the joint line or towards the tibial cut. Then femoral component can be used to either uh, flex, either increase in size or posteriorly uh, translate. Then if at all it doesn't uh, solve, then we go in for a distal femoral cut and in case of very severe deformities, fractional lengthening of the uh, posterior structures. So that's the small summary. Great. So that summarizes basically the steps in a flexion contracture. And uh, if we go back now to another fairly difficult deformity to deal with, and that's hyperextension. Can we? Yeah. Okay. So in hyperextension, do you think it's commonly missed or, we, or it's very rarely seen? Is it uncommon or commonly missed? It's very common. 
It's, it's very common and we should examine the patients carefully during gait and after anesthesia. It usually unmasks itself after anesthesia. That's a great point and most people actually can see a flexion contracture because you can see the leg rotated and there's a gap behind the knee. But unless you lift the foot up, you're not going to see a hyperextension deformity, which is why it's commonly missed. Uh, what, are, what are the other um, things you would like to evaluate preoperatively in patients with severe hyperextension? Neuropathy, especially diabetes or any occult, occult neuropathic joints. So that's what one should rule out, especially in Raker water more than 10 degrees. Dr. Raja? Generalized ligament laxity. You need to examine other joints. It can be familial also. I have two sisters, both have hyperextension. So that the second sister, I put additional distal femoral augment to make it tight. Neurology, these are things. Right. Gautam? So I agree with everything that's been said, but what is important to also recognize that there is an element of physiological hyperextension. Some of us have got inbuilt hyperextension, but no pathology in the joint. But when it comes to doing a knee replacement on such patients, uh, uh, you need to be mindful of that, that you don't place the implant into hyperextension and let the knee go into hyperextension. Right. In that case, it is probably better to resect less or build up as a... So we come to that, yourself. yeah. And what about spinal problems? How often do you see patients with uh, spinal canal stenosis having hyperextension? I think it's a very commonly missed uh, that's problem. Right, that's yeah. right, yeah. Parag, any other thoughts? No, so just the neurological disorders, you know, some of these patients who have residual polio or, you know, other disorders, we should rule them out. We should find out what is the level of the muscle weakness. And I always send these patients for an EMG nerve conduction study when I see a patient. Excellent, with, uh, excellent point. Extension. So when you see hyperextension, you've got to be rather careful of the neurological condition. So now this is a guy with flexion on one side and hyperextension on the other side. Um, you can see the x-ray down below. So now this is the fundamental problem, right? Your extension gap is huge and your flexion gap is less compared to the extension gap. So how are you going to balance this, Anup? So typically it will be less distal femur resection, at least two or three millimeters less. And these knees are globally lax. So you need to resect less of tibia. Maybe four or five millimeters is enough to uh, snug in both the gaps. And you leave them a little tight, maybe five degrees of flexion. Dr. Raja, any other additional features? Uh, valgus deformity can have hyperextension because of the bone loss on the distal femur and tightness of the IT band. The IT band access shifts anterior to the knee joint, it becomes a hyperextension force. So release IT band. Yes. 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 And Dr. Uh, uh, Gautam? No, nothing different. Nothing different. The, the most important bit is the resection level has to be less than an available. Take off less, do no release at all, especially at the back of the knee. In a valgus with a with a hyperextension deformity, would you change the uh, cut of the distal femur vis-a-vis -vis the mechanical and anatomical axis of the femur or would you still cut it in five or six degrees valgus? No, I do individualize valgus correction angle for the particular patient. What is the valgus correction angle? I do the same. Even distal resection, I don't change. I think that is Sir's paper on uh, the valgus correction angle. So that is the common thing, you know, and we've heard Dr. Anavat say many times, you know, cut just three degrees. But I particularly don't agree with that, to be honest. It's you measure what it is, the difference between the mechanical and anatomical axis and get your valgus, match it to that. It's not like just three degree for valgus. I don't do that. Yeah. So you would just build up the hypoplastic lateral condyle if it yeah. were to be there. All right. So essentially the other thing you can do is to downsize your femoral component so that you enlarge your flexion gap as it were and try and match it to your flexion gap. So you might wish to downsize the femur by one size perhaps and that will help you to equalize your gaps. So this is the uh, uh, intra-op appearance of this patient. And typically, how much would you like to leave them uh, slightly flexed, neutral, or hyperextended slightly at the end of the procedure? What would you like to see them? Neutral. Little flexed. Little flexed. Three or four degrees Three flexion. Three to five degrees. Five degrees. Yeah, about. So leave them in a few degrees of flexion. And what would you do post-op? How do you manage them? Any particular splintage, any particular positioning? Ask them to keep a pillow under the knee, but 
most of them don't comply i think but <laughs> that's one thing you can yeah this it's this easier for them to comply for a pillow under the knee rather than under the ankle i've seen most patients happy to keep a pillow under the knee absolutely so they're very happy with the pillow under the knee for for these type of cases and i'm happy as well and probably um, refrain from static quads exercises you can get them to do active slr strengthening the quads but try and avoid getting them to re reduce the gap behind the knee so this is a patient post op hyperextension who's going to summarize dr raja and we have the next presentation please and then that'll bring us in time for the revision session So hyperextension, we look at etiology, could be inflammatory arthritis combined with valgus deformity. You can have a neuromuscular deformity or a neuropathic arthritis. So under resection, we are discussed. If necessary, we can augment the distal femur in severe hyperextension deformities. In valgus deformity, you correct the valgus deformity and build up the distal femur, you will be able to correct it. In neuropathic arthritis, we discussed, we assess joint position and vibration sense, MRI of the spine and nerve conduction study. If the cortices power is good, we do a TC3 rotating platform uh, knee. If it is severe neuropathic arthritis with cortices base, uh, weakness, we go for a hinge type of joint. Thank you. That was brilliant, Dr. Raja. Excellent. Okay, so can we go back now to the last uh, section, which is now talking about revisions and how do we go around balancing the uh, uh, failed knee? So this is a patient who had a valgus deformity to start with. This was operated somewhere else. And you can see that this valgus knee has gone into varus on the full length x-ray. You can see the gap opening up laterally. So let's first dissect the causes for this failure. Why is this knee unstable? Parag, any thoughts? So I have to work up the patient. Is there infection? No, we rule out all those things. So now then we're talking about instability here. So now we can see it's obviously it's loose, so it may be malalignment, which has uh, led to this uh, early poly failure, leading to wear and uh, you know, loosening. And you find out what are the you know, other causes. So this is what I would do to work up this patient. I would also keep in mind, uh, you know, the poly which has been used is quite thick. And the, there may be a mismatch between the flexion and extension gaps, so which also can be a cause for uh, early failure. Gautam, any thoughts on the x-ray? So, um, if possible, I'd like to see the pre-op x-ray, but presume that it's not available. Uh, no, pre-op. Pre the pre -op. You mean immediate post-op? Oh, the, okay, it's on the valgus thing. So, the basic problem here is the tibial cut, and the alignment of the, the uh, tibial cut is there's increased resection on the medial side to the extent that the entire tibial component has uh, gone into increased amount of varus. The, subsequently, the, the femoral component has been planned based on the tibial cut, so the whole alignment has changed, and there has been an excessive release on the medial side, which is why it has failed. How do we, uh, assuming everything is normal, rebuild the tibia you, first? One, one moment. We, what, what we do next is in a moment. Dr. Raja, do you agree with the analysis? Why is this knee unstable? So valgus knee has been overcorrected. Tibial component has been cut in virus. These are two things which has led to failure. Uh, gap balancing, soft tissue balancing not correct. Probably over release on the lateral side and tibial component in virus. What do you say, Anup? What's the size of the femoral component like? Yeah, so I, I think the size of the poly gives us an idea what happened on the table. Probably led to instability, over release on the lateral side. Malalignment and instability often go together. And I think this is the case where both are going together. So you can see that the posterior offset of the femoral component is very small. So you can see they have undersized the femoral component, so they had a very large flexion gap. So they put in a huge poly and then did a release to fit that in probably and made it more unstable. And then it's subsequently led to wear and loosening. So there's no infection. So now how will you proceed? Pranav, any thoughts? So this will need to undergo revision after the entire Yeah, so what do you revise it? How will you revise? So now in revision you have, when you remove the implant, this is the situation you face, right? You've got to take those implants out. 
typically your flexion gap is going to be larger than your extension gap. Is that uh, a general statement that can be made? Most, most, most cases, most cases. Most cases. Most cases, right? Most cases. In this particular case, it may have been equal, so it's easier perhaps. But most of the times, your flexion gap exceeds yeah. your extension gap, right? Now, how will you balance it? So first, we go in for removal of implants, go in for the TBL uh, resurfacing, then look at removal of the femoral implant, look at the flexion gap, then the extension gap, so now we've build got the, the flexion gap here. first. Now we have these gaps. How are you going to balance this knee now? Are you going to use constrained hinge, thicker inserts? How are you going to get the gaps? The hinge would be used if there is any laxity in the lateral, in the collateral ligaments. I wouldn't okay. use so a hinge, no hinge unless. All right. So metal wedges and bone grafts, if necessary. So what are the metal wedges going to be used on the tibia, on the posterior femur? aspect of the femur at the moment? Posterior, posterior aspect, aspect of, of the femur. femur. So you're going to rebuild the posterior uh, condylar offset, right, with augments. Would everyone agree with that? Any difference, Gotham? No, it's a question of posteriorizing the femur and perhaps distalizing it as well at the same time. That will allow you to close a little bit of the gap and uh, al allow the patella as well to go up. So you're now talking about joint line restoration. So in, in revisions, you need to get your joint line more or less yeah, restored but not, to not, what it should be. Yeah. And you could either do that by just putting in thicker and thicker inserts or, or you could bring the joint line to the correct level, right? By using augments. Is that what you're saying, Gautam? Yes. So distalize the uh, uh, femoral component and posteriorize it at the same time because posteriorization will pick up the uh, increased laxity of, on the flexion space. Dr. Raja, any other views? So the TPL side, I might need a medial wedge because the TPL is in virus. When you're correcting the virus, you'll have medial defect. We might need to add a medial wedge with a stem. Femoral side, I will build up the posterior condyle with the posterior augments and if necessary, uh, distal augments as we go. Okay. On the, on How would we look for restoration of joint line intraoperatively? So for that, you need to actually, yeah. Look at, look at the meniscal remnant, yeah. if you can, if you can find it there. Or the other way is to uh, distalize it 2.5 centimeters below the medial epicondyle. That's where the joint line is. In these okay. are the cases I would, you know, like to go one level higher of constraint. Keep a TC3 or a LCCK ready. So, so here it, uh, it will, we were to able to get away. away with the PS knee because there's no fundamental problem with your uh, collaterals and you can balance the gaps quite well. We've had to use a full thickness augment on the tibia uh, in order to reduce the extension gap. Now for this, I think there would be no option but to use a hinge. Hinge. a hinge. So we're all in agreement when the collateral's completely gone, then you need to revise to a hinge. And that's what we did. So who's going to, I think Dr. Anup will come and tell us quickly how to uh, summarize, how will you balance a knee in revision? All right, so first of all, analyze the range of movement. If it's a stiff knee, especially knee which bends less than 90 degree, you may need a tibial tubercle osteotomy, which is a useful adjunct to balance the knee because if it's uh, associated with patella baha, you can actually proximalize the TTO to ensure that you get decent range of motion. So that's first. Second thing is clear the lateral and the medial gutters. Dual prophylactic lateral release especially if it's tight, stiff knee with a spacer in situ. That will give good mobilization of the patella. Tibial cut first with the intramedullary jig and ensure you remove the cement completely before you put the intramedullary jig. Don't cut too much of tibia, just a couple of millimeters usually from the lateral aspect. Upsize on the femur because usually the flexion gap is more. Rotation parallel to the interepicondylar inter axis and parallel to tibia. Most important, use offset stems if possible to posteriorize the femur and lateralize the femur. So the position of the implant is dictated by the stems. So use that to your advantage by posteriorizing the femur and lateralizing and same on the tibia. So this case example, you can see that we have used the offset, anteriorized the offset to posteriorize the femur. That snugs is the flexion gap and leaves a good uh, patellar femoral compartment for uh, good mobility of the uh, knee. Thank you very much. Excellent. So, thanks uh, Pranav. Uh, if you'd like to uh, use the mic and just... Thank you so much. Uh, 
Dr. Mullaji sir for moderating this lovely session. Thank you all our panelists, Dr. Anup Jurani, Dr. Dhanashekara Raja, Dr. Gautam Chakravarti, Chairperson Dr. Parag Sancheti. Thank you so much for being here and thank you everyone for a patient here. Thank you very much for putting up with this torture. <laughs> Thanks Arun, you did a good, great job like always.